Okay, and I'm going to share my screen so everyone can see the slides. Is everyone seeing the slides? Not yet. Are you seeing them yet? No. Nope. No. Okay. Hold on. Might be having technical difficulties. Getting there. Starting. All right, do you see them now? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Let's start. Um, and um, so, first of all, we're, we're really excited that so many people are um, interested enough in publishing in Writing Center or publishing about Writing Center work that they would show up to this on a Friday afternoon. I have no idea what time it is in Liverpool, probably Friday evening. So thank you, everyone. We're really excited to have you here. Um, on the slide that you're seeing now, you can see a web address that will take you to a handout version of the slides in case you're someone who likes to have something to write notes on and annotate as we're going, or you can always go back after the webinar to get those slides. So um, this is the third WLN webinar that the three of us have done together. Um, this one is on finding ideas for scholarship and everyday writing center work. And um, what we're really going to focus on here is how most research and publication comes out of the everyday happenings in your writing center. So we're going to talk about how you can recognize how you can contribute to the scholarly conversation and frame your contribution in a way that makes it useful to other writing center practitioners. Before we launch into the content, I just want to highlight a few logistical items. First, as we said, this is a live recording. So after the webinar, we'll make the recording available so that you can watch it again if you want, or folks who weren't able to fit this into their schedule can watch the recording. And it'll be linked on the WLN blog. Um, it might be a day or two before we get that link created and posted. So look for announcements on the WLN blog and through the W Center listserv about where to find that link. Um, and then we'll be using the chat tool for question and answers after the presentation. And if questions come up for you during the presentation, go ahead and type them into the chat tool. And then when we get to the Q&A portion of the presentation, we will answer all of those questions. Um, so we're just going to do some quick introductions of the three of us. I'm Elizabeth Kleinfeld. I direct the Writing Center and am Professor of English at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Hi, my name is Sohi Lee. I'm Faculty Director and Assistant Professor at the California State University Channel Islands. And, I'm and oh wait, did I call, my Writing Center is called <laughs> the Writing and Multiliteracy Center at our university. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, I'm Julie Preble, and I'm an associate professor at Occidental College, where I also serve as writing programs and writing center director. Okay, so in our last webinar, we introduced the concept of the scholar's journey, which takes Joseph Campbell's hero concept shown here and recasts it as the scholar's journey. Um, as you can see, the scholar's journey has many of the same elements and themes that the um, that, that Joseph Campbell's model has. So for example, Campbell's call to action, we've reframed it as the call to publish. Both models involve mentors and helpers and trials and turning points. So um, we see a lot of overlap there. Through this webinar and the two that we've done previously, we're covering every phase of the scholar's journey. So the first webinar looked at um, the reward and return, which is um, actually submitting an article to WLN. The second webinar covered the middle part of the process, um, focusing on conducting literature reviews and managing obstacles to writing. This webinar will focus in on that first part, finding ideas and making the decision to write toward publication. We'll focus in this webinar on writing articles and then in our fourth webinar, which we'll offer in the fall, we will be focusing on writing a tutor's column. We want to emphasize in this webinar that ideas for articles usually do begin in everyday writing center work. So, for example, we might wonder if there's a better way to do something like training tutors, or we might notice that methods that we've used for, for a long time don't work as well as they have in the past. So, um, like in my writing center, we noticed that what we were doing with multilingual students 
was no longer working with the new generation of multilingual students that we were seeing. Um, or maybe we make a surprising discovery when we're doing a routine assessment. So in any case, making the move from thinking about a topic to writing about it for an audience should involve a few key moves. And those are the, the um, key moves that we're gonna focus on today in the webinar. And those moves are being relevant to readers, meeting the scope and offering an appropriate methodology. So this is Sohi speaking. Um, Elizabeth talked about making that move from thinking about a topic to actually writing about it by considering those three categories, readers, scope, and methodology. Uh, we approach all three of these categories by using a heuristic, and these are just questions framed to help you gain insight into how you can shape your ideas to meet the standards of published articles. So being aware of these questions will help you better prepare your ideas for journal, journal reviewers. And just as a side note, uh, don't worry about writing down these questions. We'll share what we covered in a handout at the end of the webinar. So to start, I'll be covering the first set of questions on being relevant to readers. Uh, once you have an idea that you would like to publish in WLN, you'll want to consider running your ideas through a basic audit of, of questions about readers. So question number one asks, how does your work contextualize the writing center idea in light of existing scholarship in writing centers? This question asks you to consider your idea in light of past and current literature and research. In doing this, you'll help your readers better understand how your work compares to their approaches, as well as establish your scholarly identity. A good example of a writer who contextualizes our idea is Alice Hornig in Reading, Securing Its Place in the Writing Center. Her article opens with a scholarship on reading, uh, I'm sorry, opens with scholarship on reading in writing center studies. She, she cites actually three, um, I'm sorry, four authors, Rebecca Howard, Sandra Jamison, Ellen Carrillo, and Travis Adams. So th the second heuristic question on readers asks, does your article explain how data, examples, or results are clearly relevant to readers of WLN? So this question helps readers understand the connections between your specific case study or research results and its implications to writing centers in general. So returning back to Horning's article as an example, you'll see that she follows her analysis of research with general implications for tutors that might be relevant for all centers and what directors and administrators can do as a result of these findings. The last heuristic question on readers asks, how will your article provide new, useful, or different information for its readers? If so, how will the readers be able to put it into practice? This last question helps you articulate the different or unique contributions of your idea and how your idea provides practical contribution. Again, um, if you look at Horning's article, she provides three concrete strategies for tutors and other centers to apply. So in summary, I reviewed some heuristic questions that might help your article idea be more relevant to readers of WLN. In the next section of the webinar, Julia, I mean, I'm sorry, Julie will provide heuristics that will help you design your ideas to fit the scope of the journal. Hi again, everybody. This is Julie now moving into the scope section. Um, so as you prepare your manuscript for submission to WLN, Along with considering the journal's readership, as so he was talking about, you need to consider the scope of your article. So for the next couple of slides, scope has to do with both the overall length of an article and what you can reasonably cover in terms of a topic in the space requirements of the journal. So the first question with respect to scope asks, is your article scaled to fit the word limit requirements of WLN? For WLN, full-length articles um, need to be under 3,000 words, which includes endnotes and a works cited or bibliography. And tutors column or review articles need to be under 1,500 words, which also includes notes and works cited, etc. Um, we're drawing today on a special issue of WLN on reading. 
um, issue 4178. Um, and so this slide looks at what does a 3,000 word or 1,500 word article look like? How much research can you reasonably cover and address in this length? And so this special issue of WLN on the topic of reading provides a useful illustration of different aspects of scope. Reading as a topic can be very broad, and we might envision any number of articles uh, or approaches and research about reading in the context of writing center work. For this special issue, we can see that the authors each examined a specific aspect of the topic of reading and writing centers to narrow the scope to the appropriate length. Going back to Horning as an example, um, Horning focuses on three strategies that she identifies as helpful to use during Writing Center tutorials. Greenwell and Fontaine Iskra both focus on the creation and use of rhetorical reading guides, each from their own perspectives as a director and Writing Center tutor. And then finally, in her article for the special issue, Carrillo explores one aspect of reading, reading for purpose, as a tool for Writing Center tutors to learn and use in their consultations. The second question on scope asks, can you narrow your scope to one or two key questions that you can support with your research data or findings? It's common to try to want to cover too much ground in any one article or to believe that we have to cover a topic comprehensively. For shorter pieces like the ones you might write for WLN, think instead about how you might narrow the scope of your project to consider just a slice of the larger topic. As you determine and evaluate your research question, for example, you might consider what aspect of the more general topic will you explore? Questions should not have an easy yes or no answer. Is your research question complex enough? Your research question will also need to be focused and specific enough to answer within the scope of the word count requirements. And it might take several revisions of your question to arrive, to arrive at the right balance of complexity and specificity of focus. And I think many of us have experienced that in our publishing. Um, finally, consider the so what of your research question or questions. Why does this topic matter to you? Why, as so he noted above, should it matter to others? As you narrow your scope, be sure you do not lose sight of the so what and make sure your introduction clearly articulates this so what. Um, on my final slide here, going back to the same issue um, in WLN on reading, here are the ways the authors of the articles achieved the balance of complexity and specificity, as all of these examples show a clear focus on a, a slice of a broader topic, in this case, the topic of reading and writing center work. In sample one, Horning narrows her scope to a consideration of reading and writing center work through the three specific strategies <clears throat> Excuse me. And importantly, she notes that these approaches are not exhaustive of the reading strategies consultants can put to good use. So she's just narrowed her scope to three. Greenwell, in her article, explains the concept of rhetorical reading guides and notably the specific benefits of RRGs in writing center work. And then relatedly, in her tutor's column, Fontaine Iskra focuses on one aspect of the RRGs, their ability to strengthen audience awareness. I'm going to turn this over to Elizabeth um, so she can talk about methodology. So the first methodology question asks, how does the article offer evidence and support that matches the argument being made? And this question is really asking you to consider how the data analysis, how the data and analysis in your article fit the project that you're conducting and the expectations of the particular journal, in this case, WLN. So um, the Alice Horning article that uh, we've mentioned a couple times illustrates this really well. Horning makes clear that she'll review the literature on reading and then base her conclusions and recommendations on that literature review. So it's really clear to readers of this article that Horning didn't conduct original empirical research, rather she reviewed the literature. And so the um, conclusions that she reaches, which are these three recommendations, are based on the literature review that she conducted. Other types of articles may offer very different kinds of evidence though. So the type of evidence offered is gonna depend on the argument being made. So whereas Alice Horning's article made suggestions based on a review of other scholars' research, Amanda Greenwell's article on the rhetorical reading guides, which Julie mentioned, relies on local examples. 
her article is a practitioner's narrative where she's talking about what she did in her writing center and what her tutors did. So she's um, describing the tutor's work and how the rhetorical reading guides were developed and, and used. So appropriately, she draws on the practices of her tutors, describing what they do and giving specific examples from the rhetorical reading guides that they've developed. Um, in this particular excerpt on the slide, Greenwell is referring to a particular tutor in her writing center and quoting from the rhetorical reading guide that tutor created. And again, this um, this data that's being offered as an example flows naturally from what Greenwell has set up as her methodology, which was to talk about what was happening in her writing center and what her tutors did. Um, in contrast, Andrea Scott's article from a, a different issue, this is not from the, the reading specific issue. Um, this one talks about writing center directors in Germany and Austria and how they shape their narratives about writing center work. And it does draw on original empirical research. So it provides a really good example of how a different topic with a different research strategy is going to require a different um, way of explaining what the methodology was. So her methodology is clearly described so that readers will know exactly how she collected and analyzed data and why she conducted the type of research that she did, in this case, a survey. So she first talks about um, why she did a survey and what it was based on. Then she describes how the survey was distributed and the um, percentage of returns that she got. And then she talks specifically about the questions that the analysis and the rest of the article will focus on. So this brings us to the second methodology question. The second methodology question focuses on how well readers will be able to understand your methodology, asking, is the methodology clearly and succinctly described? This is particularly important if, like Scott, your project involves original research, because ideally you want readers to be able to judge the um, validity of the research and um, if they're really interested to actually be able to replicate the research. Um, because WLN articles are only 3,000 words long, you have to be really economical with the words that you choose to describe your methodology. So it's got to be really brief, but still readers need to be able to understand what data was collected and how. As we saw, Scott described her methods briefly, but with enough detail that readers could clearly understand what her conclusions are based on. Um, finally, we want to comment on IRB, Institutional Review Boards, um, which exist at many institutions to review human subjects research. Um, and what I have on the slide is the statement that WLN has on its website that um, says it, that the editors will assume that authors whose research involves human subjects have obtained the approval of the IRB at their institution. Um, and we know that some institutions actually don't have IRBs. And so if you're wanting to do human subjects research, and that would be almost any research that involves interacting with or surveying or studying the clients who come into your center and the tutors who work in your center. So lots and lots of the things that, that we do. Um, if you don't have an IRB at your institution, you might think that this note represents a huge roadblock for you. So. Um, we have learned that some institutions with IRBs will consider and um, review work from people who are at institutions that don't have IRBs, and they're much more likely to do that if you partner with someone from that institution. So if you're at institution A, which doesn't have an IRB, but you're friendly with a writing center director at institution B, who, which does have an IRB, you might ask the director at institution B to be a co-PI with you, and that means that they will um, collaborate with you in putting forward your protocol to get IRB approval. Um, and if other people in this webinar have ideas about other ways to get IRB approval, if you're at an institution that doesn't have an institutional review board, that would be a really great uh, resource material to share using the chat tool or in the Q&A. Well, this concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. Uh, we did intentionally want to keep our presentation short so that we can maximize uh, feedback from all of you. Uh, we want to also draw your attention to the URL that's provided on this slide. Uh, the link is going to lead you to a handout of heuristic questions that we covered today. And finally, um, so that with our remaining time, we'd like you to share, if you are interested, 
the topics that you might be considering for publication. Or you can also ask any questions that's come up during our webinar and we'll try to answer them. So uh, please, uh, to pose any questions, uh, use the chat tool that we have available right now. So we have a couple of questions up there, Elizabeth. Yeah, and um, I think because I'm showing my slides, I am not easily able to see those questions. Oh. So I'm going to... Um, you want me to read them? Yeah, I ask one of you to read them. <laughs> I was wondering, Elizabeth, can you end this, the sharing? Part? I can end the share. Yeah, let me stop the share. Although it might be useful for people to have the handout on the screen. Mm. Or may, maybe not. Let's, let's try it this way. And if people want me to go back to sharing, um, just put a comment in the chat. Okay, so uh, first question during the webinar is if, Writing with practitioner examples as your main evidence, is IRB still required if no identifiers are included? I have had research situations. Well, first, let me start by saying um, the rule of thumb that I follow is to always submit something to IRB. And if they decide that it didn't need to be submitted, they'll let you know. So I've had a few situations where I was doing practitioner type research and I submitted it to my IRB and they came back and said, this is actually exempt. So you know, mm -hmm. go on with, with your life. And then other times they say, this is not exempt and we need a lot more documentation from you. So I think it can go either way, depending on the peculiar, peculiarities of the, the research that you're conducting. Mm -hmm. Julian Sohi, did you have more to say about that? Well, Sohi and Elizabeth and I are working on a, a piece together. And I know that Elizabeth started, I think you started the IRB process. Mm -hmm article and was required by your institution, as I recall. Um, mm -hmm. But when I ran it through my institution, they sort of looked at me and said, why are you running this through us? We don't really, it's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it was rather strange. Um, uh, so I think just the rule of thumb I use as well, like Elizabeth, is if I'm unsure at all, I'll at least make a phone call to our IRB director and ask a question. Um, the next question is, what topics do you feel are rarely explored in WLN submissions? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, that's a tough one in part because we, uh, the three of us as co-editors, we are co-associate editors, we don't read submissions. Um, and that's intentional on our, on, on our part so that we can provide support um, for, for potential authors in this way. Um, but I don't know if so here, Elizabeth, you have anything that you're thinking off the top of your head since we are avid readers of WLN um, that maybe we don't see as often. Um, I feel like the question is maybe um, suggesting that you have a better chance of getting published if you write about something that no one has ever written about before. And I would actually um, suggest that that's not the case. I think that the, the topic slice concept that Julie presented is really helpful to um, remind us that even topics that have been published on quite a bit, not everything has been said about those topics. And even if everything was said about those topics 10 years ago, you know, a lot new has happened in the, the 10 years that have passed. And so like the, the reading issue is a really good example of that. There were multiple articles about the same topic, reading, but still there's a ton more to say about reading. So um, although I don't really know which topics are rarely explored, I actually wouldn't really worry about that. Right. Um, did either of you, Julian, so he wanted. Yeah, I think you're very eloquent. <laughs> I think you covered it. I think honestly, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I never worry about whether or not it's being covered. Um, it sometimes it happens that it's not covered, uh, and that's great. Um, but, um, uh, but, 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 but often is the case that I think, regardless to whether or not it's covered, it's really how you're approaching it. And you might find that there's ways in which, um, past publications can really help you understand the way you're going to approach it and talk about it and frame frame what you're doing. But it's always interesting. I mean, I think we were all talking at some point about like the very common topic of tutor training, but there's like an end of, like an endless, uh, that's an endless like topic, right? Like there's so many things to say about tutor training. Uh, um, I don't see that there would be an end to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I think it's, it's also on the other side, just, you know, you want to do your homework. Um, so even if you think maybe no one has approached a certain topic, obviously doing some quick research at least to see if anyone has worked on it. Um, if you're submitting this to WLN, spending some time, and I know we've talked about this in our previous webinars as well, but spending some time looking at what the journal has published um, on per perhaps on your topic or related to your topic, closely related, can be very useful and maybe be a launch pad for your own um, article as well. And I would also add that Mickey Harris, who's the editor in chief of WLN, is a really great person. You can actually just reach out to her and send her an email and say, I'm thinking of writing an article about XYZ. What would you suggest? Or is this something that would be of interest? And I guarantee you, she will get back to you and tell you what she thinks. Um, she always has really great ideas and um, she's super supportive of authors. Yeah, one of the questions, we're, I'm jumping ahead a couple of questions if that's okay, but it was a question, Elizabeth, that actually you just spoke to, which is if you have a unique idea or something you've had a hard time finding scholarship on, would it be appropriate to query the editors on your idea or mm -hmm. just by submitting it? And as Elizabeth just said, I think we've, we've all worked with Mickey in this capacity and have found her and the other um, editors as well, very receptive to query questions, um, mm -hmm. kind of in different questions. And certainly when I published my first piece with WLN, um, I, I did not have, I was not finding a lot of material related to my topic and I did query Mickey directly. And I said, hi, I'm, you know, a new assistant professor and I'm working on this piece. I don't know if this is unconventional or not, but I just wondered, um, you know, is this a topic that you think the journal might be interested in seeing or do you know if others have written on it and you know whatever um, and I found her to be very helpful and receptive. I, I would add one more thing which is that um, even even if it's not published maybe as a topic in writing center work mm -hmm. there may be related uh, fields that have published on it yeah. and like I did a lot of work with multimodal communication and com composition and at the time, there wasn't a lot of material published in writing center journals or articles, but but there was plenty published in composition, right? And so, it, it you know you might want to look at related fields. Um, and in fact, it's it's being encouraged right now. There's a trend towards being more interdisciplinary. So you you want to think about if it's not specifically in our discipline, where is it being talked about and how are they talking about it? And then you might be able to bridge that towards writing center. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the other IRB question? Yeah, so someone asked, um, have others ever attempted doing IRB after collecting data? I know that's not ideally the way it goes. Um, and then also asking about high school writing centers. So to the first question, um, I think it varies from IRB to IRB. The IRB on my campus absolutely will not even look at um, requests for approval after data has been collected, um, which I learned the hard way because I did submit something after collecting really rich data. And I was devastated to learn that that really rich data was actually completely unusable. But um, you only have to learn that lesson once. <laughs> and my, I wanted to add to that too, even at my institution, which I think is smaller than yours, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. um, a small liberal arts college, uh, my writing tutors were working on a project. And even though I said to them, it would be really helpful if you send this to IRB first, they went ahead and collected data before IRB. And then IRB, the IRB office came back and said, no, <laughs> you have to now start your project over. So it was a, it was a good learning tool. <laughs> yeah. Um, most IRBs have a, a person, either a chair of the board or um, an office manager or someone that you can reach out to and ask questions of. And it's a good idea if you're kind of new to this kind of research to um, make a meeting with that person and, and maybe just say, I've never done this kind of research, but I'm, I'm going to start. Um, what are some of the things that I need to know? And then ask them those types of questions. And th they've heard it all so that they will not judge you at all for asking those questions, especially if you preface it by saying, I'm kind of new at this. Mm -hmm. I like Rebecca Babcock's comment on this topic. Um, and Rebecca, I often find your words very helpful. <laughs> um, um, like conducting a search without a warrant. Um, if you do. Right run your project through without the IRB first. So yeah. Good way to sum it up. 
Um, and then I want to be sure we address the high school writing center portion of that question. Um, I don't think high schools ever have IRBs. And so this would be a situation where you would need to partner with someone at a, a other institution. And um, the regional IWCA affiliates are a really good way to get to know other people at neighboring institutions who might be willing to kind of co-sponsor a, a protocol if you want to send it through their institution's IRB. And um, I haven't done that, but I've been approached by um, a couple local high schools and asked if I would do that. Um, and I always say yes. Um, and then nothing has come of it yet, but that doesn't mean that it won't. Okay, and then there's a second IRB related question. Um, if institutions at large are already involved in some kind of assessment, is IRB required to work with the data that's already being collected? So if there's already data being collected for some reason at the institution, can we tap into that without running it through a separate IRB process? The, the rule that I've always heard is that um, data that's collected for internal assessments is different from data that's going to be used for presentation and publication. And so even if it's data that's already collected, um, you can't use it for presentation or publication purposes without IRB. Is that, Sohi and Julie, in line with what you've heard? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it also depends on what kind of data yeah. you're talking about. Right? Yeah. Um, I mean, our, my institution collected some data on first year writing experiences. And um, for larger WASC assessment purposes, and I wanted to use some of that for something, and the my RIRB said it was fine because I was using it basically for the same purpose, um, and they they passed it through. So, so so that again goes back to the the rule of thumb about when in doubt, go ahead and submit it to IRB and see what they say. Um, okay, uh, so where are we in our? Questions. We already answered the question from Christy about unique ideas. Query the, um, the editors. I have to. I want to say, and I hope I'm not outing myself too much here. If there's any editors on this list, but um, I often query editors, <laughs> um, and and I'm working on a piece right now that happens to be. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but happens to be on a very popular show, television show, um, and so I was worried before I sent it to a particular journal if they already have seven articles on that show in the queue then I might send it somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. um, to not waste all of our time. And, and I don't know, I say it's not going to hurt. I have found editors mainly to be very, um, a good resource and, and professional and helpful. So, mm -hmm. um, question about anticipated timeline between submission and publication in WLN. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think any of the submission editors are on our webinar right now, otherwise I would turn that question directly to them. Um, ideas, anyone? So he most recently published one. Yeah, well, I think it depends, right? Because it depends on how many times, like how long it goes to reviewers and it comes back for, for uh, revisions and goes back to them and so that process is often long and then on top of that there's special issues and that's also a, another long process like I have something that's being processed under special review and that that's been longer than um, I hope <laughs> so I would say like longer than a year that's that's a very long time I think the average would be probably a year or maybe a little less than a year uh, it really depends. Sometimes it can go through really, really quickly. So uh, it depends on what, you know, what issue that is and, you know, whether or not there, there needs to be a lot of revision and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I do think it's variable. I think my first article with WLN actually ended up going through really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in part, um, there were some practical considerations it fit the space requirements of that particular journal issue. It was well under 3,000 words and they wanted a piece that was within, I don't remember how, how maybe it was 2,500 or something and, and it fit well. <laughs> um, and uh, so that it could be anything and it, the timing just happened to work out. So, you know, but again, otherwise it could be six months to a year. Okay, so the next question is, what does an accepted revise and resubmit and rejection article typically look like? In other words, can you talk about the features for each category? Mm -hmm. um, first, I would say that just accepted as is 
is not a thing that happens very regularly. Um, so what that article looks like, it looks like a Pegasus or a unicorn um, because it's pretty rare. <laughs> And I think one thing we, we emphasized in this webinar, um, briefly at least, the idea that you have to, when you're starting to pull together your article or your piece of writing that you will eventually submit, that you have to be willing to revisit your research question. I think mm -hmm. that is also a sort of rule of thumb in general, right? That um, the expectation would be that you will not have a piece accepted outright. Um, and so that you will receive some suggestions for revision um, to revise and resubmit, right? Um, I mean, there may be others on this list or on this in this chat who have received an outright accepted article. Um, I look forward to that day. I just don't think <laughs> it's happen. <laughs> <laughs> I had it happen once at another journal and it was after it had the, the article had been rejected by two journals and then it was accepted as is by the third journal and I figure I should have bought a lottery ticket that day and since I didn't I'm never playing the lottery again because my, my chances are over now. <laughs> I, I do want to address the question about features though um, and that that draws our attention back to the heuristic set of questions that we had actually during our webinar because those questions are the kind of questions that reviewers actually are asking themselves when they yeah. they consider um, submissions. I, I'm, I'm a reviewer for over four journals and really these are the kind of questions they ask. It's like, are they contextualizing with, you know, enough literature? Is it relevant? Um, does it meet the scope and the expectations of the journal and the readers? Um, you know, does, it's, is, is the methodology appropriate and rigorous enough or, uh, you know, for, for whatever that they're submitting? You know, uh, is it offering something new and important, right? So these are the, the kind of questions that reviewers have to ask themselves when they're reading it. So, if you can ask those questions ahead of time, then you're more likely to get uh, a revised resubmit, which I agree with Elizabeth. That's the most likely um, thing that you're gonna get. Um, sometimes, you know, we, I do see like, um, and as a reviewer, I would reflect on this that way too, but I see pieces that are really interesting, very original, um, but maybe they just need a lot more research work or they need to kind of review how they're framing it or it's just too broad. Um, and, and, and it's really up to the editors at that point to kind of consider based on the two reviewers, two or three reviewers, how they want to kind of send it back to the, the authors. Um, uh, they may say, uh, if they think it's a very compelling topic, they may say, we really like this, but you really need to revise it. And here's some comments by these reviewers. Um, that will give you some ways to kind of work on this to improve it so that it's a better fit. And, and that, that could take a little bit of time. So um, actually, you know, as far as like acceptances, it's usually like either you can revise and resubmit or they'll say, um, they'll decline it, but they'll say you should send it somewhere else where it's more appropriate. Or they'll say, you know, um, we don't think it needs a lot more work, that it's not ready for publication. Mm -hmm. So there's there's more nuances, I think, at the end part. But most of them are very flexible, and I, I'd say that WLN is very flexible, and they're very excited to work with new authors. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just add a couple things to what Julian so he said. Um, if you're writing a practitioner type of article where you're reflecting on your own experience in your writing center, um, one of the, the things that is um, a potential weakness in that type of article is talking about this great, exciting thing that's happening in your writing center, but not making it relevant to other writing centers. And because writing centers are really reflective of the specific contexts that they exist in, if something's working really well in Julie's writing center, because her institution is so different from mine, it might not be really relevant to me. But Julie, as an author of an article about something that's happening in her writing center, could anticipate how something that's working at her small liberal arts college might be um, framed to work at a school like mine, which is a, a giant urban non-residential commuter campus. 
Um, and then the other thing that, that I want to say is that there's no shame at all in getting a revise and resubmit. And um, sometimes newer authors are worried about, well, what will happen if my article gets a revise and resubmit? Well, what will happen is you'll revise the article and you'll resubmit it and you'll eventually get published. And that's what we all do. Everybody gets rejected and, and revise and resubmits and it's just a part of what we do. And so um, if you're holding off on submitting because you're, you're worried that um, it will be a big judgment on you by the universe if you get a revise and resubmit, I would say let that go because um, when you get your first revise and resubmit, you'll be in very good company. Yeah, yeah I, you know, that's a really good point because the first time I submitted something, um, and this is when I was a lit, lit person, I got a revise and resubmit and I was devastated because I thought that was a rejection and I didn't really see it as a opportunity to really kind of take in the comments. I just thought, well, why didn't they accept it? And, and of course, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is most of the time it's not an outright exception. They, they really do want you to, to, uh, to work on it a little bit more. Um, no, it's, so a good, it's a good comment. To, um, a couple of the other questions we should, um, so at what stage have you found it helpful to present at a conference after, after an article is written while still analyzing your data? Um, for me, it varies so widely. There are times when I have a really half-baked idea and I present it at a conference to, to get feedback on it. Or um, there are other times when I've collected a bunch of data and I think I have findings that might be useful to other people. Um, there are other times when I've kind of already written the article in my head um, and I just want to share what I, what I think is going to be the article. Um, and I haven't found that one is better than, than the other. What about you two? Same. I mean, I think um, even if I, sometimes if I'm testing out something and I'll try to find a local conference too, something that is sort of cost effective for me um, and just try the idea out there, get some feedback. I think going to IWCA is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm it's so collaborative and it's so discussion based in the when you're presenting at IWCA and you get great feedback from folks there um, mm -hmm. and then on the other hand I will there's something I'm working up now that's a piece that has already been written and so I'm going to present on again going back to my slice concept a different slice of that something that I didn't fully cover in the mm -hmm. article that I wrote but maybe want to pursue for a second piece on that similar topic. So mm -hmm. I think like Elizabeth, any time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I, I would, for me, generally it's, um, the conferences are a way to really kind of help, help me articulate what I wanna say in the article. And, and so it, it's a good idea to hit both of them, which is have a conference and then publish. If you want to publish first or submit something and, and go to a conference, I think that works well as well. But for me, it's, it's helpful to, um, to have it really thought through uh, and, and to articulate it. That seems to help me a lot in terms of really focusing what I want to say. And then I end up revising that article and making it sharper. So. Um, how would you encourage co-authorship of articles between writing center consultants and faculty, I guess, or um, direct writing center directors, maybe? Mm. Um, I, I love that question. And um, I actually, this morning before the webinar, met with um, a team of peer consultants who have been conducting research in the last year in, in my writing center. And um, they and I presented at IWCA last year, and they're now... Um, working on the article and I'm mentoring them through it. Um, so in terms of how would you encourage it, I think um, if you're a director or, or, or a faculty member who's involved with Writing Center work, um, offer to mentor students. I mean, I, I explicitly say to my peer consultants, um, you know, I think you've got a, a, an idea that, that could be publishable, let's talk about it. And then I talk to them about here's how publication works. I basically do all the things with them that these webinars are doing. And what I should start doing now is saying, watch the webinars and then come talk to me. But I think um, just inviting students to come talk to you about their ideas and encouraging them and um, being explicit with them about what's involved in, in scholarly publication is a way to start those conversations. And we're going to talk more in our fourth webinar in the fall when we do a webinar focused on writing 
for a tutor's column on, on some of these topics as well. Um, but similarly to Elizabeth, um, again, I've been working to mentor our consultants and try to get them to submit something um, for publication. Some of them may submit a solo piece to WLN tutors column. And then in a couple of cases, the students are writing uh, in a topic that uh, taps into or, or intersects with some of my research interests. Um, and so we're thinking about, oh, this could be a, lar a slightly longer piece, more collaborative, so. Um, where are we in our questions? Oh, uh, Jenny. Article to only one publication at a time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, no, that's, that's most, a good question. Well, yeah. it's a good question, but I think most peer reviewed journals even say in their submission guidelines that you cannot be submitting this piece, um, you, or, or it cannot be under review at another journal. Mm -hmm. um, I know that some places ask you to even click a box that says that, or in your cover note to state that you're not submitting it elsewhere, it's not under review elsewhere. So you, the, again, general rule of thumb is yes. And occasionally it comes up that you submit something to a journal and say four months go by and you haven't heard anything. You can always contact the editor and say, you know what's going on or you could say i'd like to rescind that submission and submit it elsewhere mm -hmm. um so don't feel like you're at the mercy of the the long submission cycle so um definitely once you submit something don't submit it elsewhere but feel free to rescind it from that first place and then send it elsewhere yeah that seems to be a, a concern just looking at the thread from the chat that you know the length of the, the cycle you know, from when they hear from the editors or even when it gets published might be very long. And so maybe you got your one piece that you think is very valuable and it's being reviewed somewhere, but you're kind of nervous about whether or not it's even going to go through. Um, yeah, this is what most people do, which is you just hold on tight. But then that also means that you want to think about very carefully where you're submitting your material. Mm -hmm. uh, make a very careful choice about where you submit and where you think it's the most appropriate place because it's going to sit there for a little bit. Um, yeah. And I think that's the question, that last one by James, right? How long is a typical publication cycle? I think we kind of talked about that from submission. It's longer than we wish. <laughs> yeah, longer than we wish. And do you find certain venues for publication better than others in thinking about this? You know, again, I think we, we can all talk about, you know, different journals and they have different missions and they take different types of articles mm -hmm. so and, and then obviously there's also different prestige level and distribution level and mm -hmm. that sort of thing i would like to say um when i was um i'm fortunate to be in a tenured position but when i was coming up for tenure and which might be an experience people have or even just any kind of review um where publications are part of that review process I, I found it helpful to check in with the editors at places where I had pieces out for review. And even just to be very candid and say, I'm submitting um, a, my, my promotion file or my tenure file or you know my review file by such and such a date, do you, do you have an idea of how long it will be before I hear from you? Um, and again, I found the editors in all cases, if I did that, to be very receptive and understanding and so I think it's not a bad idea if you feel you've been in the cycle too long, <laughs> um, as Elizabeth was saying earlier, to, to feel free to go ahead and check in. And you can check with every journal. They usually have a rate of acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a sense of um, how hard it is to publish in that journal, not to scare you off, but just to know the difficulty range. And, um, and, and it may not be that difficult, to be honest. It might be that they just get a lot of submissions. And so the percentage of, of articles that are accepted in that particular journal might be very low relative to the amount that they get. Um, I mean, just as a point, I think WLN and WCJ, Writing Center Journal, their rate of acceptance is almost equivalent. But I think it's not because of one's more difficult than the other. It's just that, um, you know, I'd, I, probably WCJ, I'm just guessing, um, probably maybe not get as many submissions as WCJ, but I don't know for sure. But the rate of acceptance is similar, 17%. Um, interesting, the last question on here is what Actually, is um, I, I just looked up the WLN 
um, acceptance rate, it's 12%. I put it in the chat. Oh, it's 12% now? Okay. Yeah. But, um, I think it depends on every, every year and even every issue. Um, Cause it's just the rate of acceptance is the number that people submit at that time. Right. And then what they ex accept, right? So it, it really does fluctuate. So when you think about the average, sometimes it's 12%, sometimes it's 20%. Special, special issues in general tend to be easier to get into than, um, than um, the normal uh, kind of journal issue. I do want to plug our webinar number one. <laughs> if anyone wants to go back and watch it on, online, um, it's, it's uh, available through WLN, the WLN website. Um, and in that webinar, I remember that I gave the acceptance percentages over, I think, four years or more. Yeah. I, I can't, I'm glad you looked this up, Elizabeth. I can't remember off the top of my head, but that 12% seems roughly, there might've been a couple that were slightly higher mm -hmm. uh, years, but mostly that's the kind of range. I feel like um, at some point we heard the number 17%. Mm -hmm. So that might be like the average between the non um, special issues and the special issues or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're almost, um, done with today. Do we have any more questions or comments from folks that are um, participants that just want to chime in with any comments on this or? Or topics, actually, because yeah. part of what we were hoping was five people minutes. to share some topics that they were thinking about. We have five minutes, Sylvia, is that right? Yeah, we have about six, six minutes. Oh, okay. No? So, um, the three of us could talk about how we would each take a different topic slice of the same topic. We, um, the three of us had talked um, just in kind of a random conversation about uh, working with, um, or trying to diversify our, our writing centers, right? Our writing center staff. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I see um, someone just posted something though. We've experimented with pop-up centers and I'd love to write about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. Gosh, I'd love to read about that. Yeah. That very interesting. So that's, a not, that's an interesting one because it's relatively like pop-up centers, I would say. I don't know. I, don't, I certainly haven't read a lot about it. Like it, maybe it might have happened, but maybe there's not like scholarship on that. So that's really interesting. And, and when they're like recent phenomenons, I think that those are things that people really want to know more about. So. Um, I like the uh, other, the next one too, on Reese, uh, director's opinions on peer tutoring centers versus writing centers and how tutors experiences are affected. I, I like your comment on that with all of the challenges. Um, indeed, that seems, um, I'm, I'm seeing that topic a lot on our listservs, right? Where people are saying, hey, my university or my institution wants to move to a peer tutoring model um, where we're all sort of together and not a writing center specific model. Have you tried this? What have been the challenges or, or, or benefits of doing that? So. I think there's rich research to be conducted there and probably lots of different slices of that research, yeah. uh, right? So I'll be interested in that. You know, one thought I have about that particular topic, because that's something of interest here at CI, is um, how organization might impact those kind of challenges, right? I mean, so if you're reporting line it's just someone else other than let's say a dean or someone who's used you're used to there's someone else in the middle then that might change things maybe um and so thinking about um these uh student success centers and and how writing centers are organized underneath that might be really interesting mm -hmm. as a side note um, a question came in that i think a lot of people might relate to in my initial research i've had trouble finding literature any tips um so he actually did, or actually it was in our, was it our first or second webinar where we talked about finding sources? It might have been the first and the second. The first one where we went through databases and you actually, Elizabeth, you went through. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, we, we did talk about that in our first webinar. Um, I also find it really helpful when I do find an article that's useful to go through the um, references list on that article and track down everything that they've cited. And then you can just keep doing that. You know, every time you find an article, track down all of their sources, then track down all of their sources. And um, so that can be a, a really good way to expand the, the pool of literature to um, review. 
And I do think other tips too, I mentioned earlier that I see some of these topics come up on different listservs that I'm, I'm on. I think posting, if you're on a listserv or want to join the, a particular listserv, posting your question there can be really useful um, or to um, the W Center Facebook page or um, mm -hmm. something like that, just to get some initial feedback. Um, and, and maybe someone will have a resource um, to offer there, but I have found that to be a useful sort of way to fish out and, and figure out if anyone's been working on this. I, um, I was working on a, a topic and couldn't find, I only found one article on it. And so I actually emailed the author of that article and I said, do you know of anything else? And she was able to point me to a couple of dissertations that were unpublished um, and that I hadn't found in my research. And so that, that was really useful. And um, writing center people are very receptive to the random email from someone who's interested in the same topic. So I would say don't be shy about emailing authors of articles if you're having trouble finding other sources, but be sure that you've actually looked really um, efficiently for those other sources before you say, oh, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. um, I just see great topics here again faculty perceptions of writing center offerings um mm -hmm. working to get irb approval to conduct the survey um and then using self assessment to place students into that's interesting into freshman comp so directed self placement um as a way to do overall writing assessment is, is a big topic um and lots there i think what's interesting here is to that sort of intersection between um, something that's more on the composition side of our field, right? Um, as it intersects with student academic support services in the writing center. That sounds very interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be mindful of the time. Uh, we just have one minute, but a, a question came in about what are your opinions about fostering good relationships between writing centers and English departments. My opinion is that an article should be written about that because there's a lot of nuances and, and complexities and it varies so much uh, by institution. But um, that would be an interesting topic to maybe do some surveys of um, you know, English department chairs and faculty and writing center directors and tutors and um, to, to find some ways of, of measuring so. Another thing about that would be maybe this is a good one where you can collaborate with other people of different institutions or maybe similar institutions as yourself and that way you can you can it's always helpful I think to collaborate I think that's something that really helps you focus and keep on track but also you might get some great ideas from your colleagues mm -hmm. um, and it would be really great to have like um, cross institutional uh, research going on with that type of topic. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say is that, you know, I see, you know, just reading some of the topics, it's really helpful to have a focus like a research question, even when you're conducting a survey, knowing like, what are you trying to get out of it? Because um, sometimes I think people just do surveys and, and they, they're collecting a lot of information, but maybe it's, it, it's not collecting the kind of information that you really want. And so thinking about that research question carefully and then and then creating that survey and then sharing that survey with some people that you trust uh, who might be able to give you good feedback would help you narrow that survey down so that you actually get data that you, that you want. Um, and someone posted a question to the Q&A, which is um, different from the chat. It is, I am interested in writing about writing directing. I think they mean writing center directing from behind the scenes or unofficially. Is there space for this? Mm -hmm. I wonder if that would be a blog, blog, you know, for the WLN blog, perhaps, or um, on the Facebook, the WLN Facebook page. Yeah. Do you, you two have other ideas? I think that's maybe where I would start um, and see what, you know, if we get some response from there, from that, from those venues. Mm -hmm. Um, given that we are out of time, um, I just want to say a couple of things. Well, three things. One, we're really excited that you all joined us and um, thank you for this really rich Q&A at the end. This, this was um, really fun for us um, and I hope it was useful for you. And please feel free to reach out to us with other questions that maybe we didn't have time to address today. Um, I want to remind you that the slides and the handout are available um, on those uh, 
the web links and that um, you'll be getting an email, I think from Sohi, um, mm -hmm. but possibly one of the other, one, either Julie or me, that will have a link to a survey uh, where we ask you to give us feedback on the, um, the webinar itself, but also we're um, inviting you in that survey to participate in some research that we're doing. So if you're interested in participating, let us know in the survey. And if, if you're not interested, that's cool too. Um, anything else, Julian Sohi? No, thank you so much. This has been great. I think this has been, um, I think having this extra time to really get feedback from people has been super productive. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, really good conversation. Um, hopefully this launches us all into uh, end of summer, or I don't even know if it's end of summer yet. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, no, gosh, it's not. Um, some more summer productivity for us all. Hopefully it requires us to get some other projects off the, off the, uh, off the ground. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.